you figure that it out. That was a lovely that. introduction. Um, and now I'd like to also introduce um, a person who keeps us all very happy um, and provides tons of support um, and attention to the admissions team, Ms. Steph McCusker. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Steph McCusker, and um, I support the admissions team um, a little bit behind the scenes. You may be familiar with my name because you've received email reminders from me or some materials from the admissions office via email. Um, and I also happen to be married to Dave McCusker, who is the head of school at this time. We've been here in the Syracuse area for a little over a year and a half now. Um, but we are very familiar with independent school education and um, we are we so are enjoying our experience here at MPH. So I'm really glad that you chose to explore this education further. Oh, it's so exciting. It's our exciting mm -hmm. Thank you, Steph. Um, so just a little reminder to everyone, if you could make sure you're on mute. I know that's the one of the um, <laughs> one of the new customs that we all have to ask one another in a Zoom setting all the time. Um, and I'm often guilty of that when I am on meetings, but just a little reminder, um, thanks for that in advance. So as Steph mentioned, she is married to our head of school, Dave McCusker, who we are fortunate enough to be joined by today. Um, Dave can never leave because he can never take Steph away from, from us and from the admissions office. Um, but we are really grateful to have Dave part of this presentation today so that you can get to hear from him directly. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our head of school, Dave McCusker. Thank you, Nicole, and uh, welcome everyone. I, um, I really appreciate your taking some time this afternoon. And uh, my understanding is that you're really at the front end of, uh, of a process uh, and a process where you're taking a look at and exploring um, options for your children and their education. And uh, as Steph mentioned, um, she and I have, we have two, two children ourselves. They're a bit older, they're 28 and 26, so they're out of the nest. But I uh, remember really clearly uh, all of these kinds of experiences as we were thinking about the needs of our children and trying to find a, a, good, um, a good school where they would be um, supported in their growth and their education. So I mentioned this because um, please, uh, as we all at MPH understand, um, we know that this is a really important consideration for you and your family. And we're here to support that regardless of outcome. Uh, we we uh, know that uh, MPH may not be, will not be the right school for everyone here. That's okay. We wanna, we wanna do what we can to help you understand as much as possible about our school and then, um, and then support you as, you as you make your decision. Um, just a little, uh, I was encouraged to provide a little bit of my background, which I don't usually do. Uh, so I'll try to keep this uh, short and sweet. Uh, I've been involved in schools for over 30 years now. Uh, Steph and I have been involved in schools in various capacities for over 30 years. And um, I've played, I think, just about every role. Uh, I've been a teacher and a coach. I've been a dorm parent, um, an advisor to students. Um, I've worked in day schools, boarding schools, and, uh, and every possible grade configuration. Um, I'm proud to call myself a, a school person. I love these environments and, um, and what we get to do every, every single day. Um, my, uh, my track record in terms of positions uh, recently, in addition to what I mentioned earlier, um, I, was, um, I got on an administrative track and worked in independent schools in the area of uh, development for a, for a long period of time. Uh, that, um, that experience uh, put me in touch with uh, schools like ours that have boards of trustees. So a lot of thinking about governance and strategic planning, communications, et cetera. Uh, fundraising is part of that set of responsibilities as well. And um, most recently I was the head of a boarding school in New Hampshire for nine years and uh, you know, that's a, that's a full immersion program. You sort of live it and breathe it and uh, happily so. We, we really enjoyed that experience. Um, all of that to say, as Steph mentioned, we're really pleased to be here at Manlius Pebble Hill School. We're relative newcomers. Uh, we've got a lot of folks here at the school have been here for a long time. And, and that is somewhat um, representative of the kind of commitment that is engendered in this community. Um, people care a lot about our school and this community. It tends to be a very tight-knit um, 
uh, community. And, uh, you know, the thing that really drew us uh, to MPH, uh, admittedly, Syracuse, New York was not necessarily on our radar. We're, we're from the Boston area. Um, I've worked at, I think, six or seven different uh, really fine schools in New England. And uh, I wasn't opposed to Syracuse, but I just didn't know much about this area. And as we learned more about Central New York and we learned more about uh, Manlius Pebble Hill School and had a chance to meet with um, a lot of folks before or during, uh, during the process where I was looking at this opportunity, Steph and I, um, and again, we're sort of veterans of schools right now. Uh, we were just really taken with um, the people we met. Uh, certainly our, our new, potentially new colleagues um, a really impressive group of educators and people who are leading the school in, in different ways. Um, I think the thing that was most um, outstanding for us was the chance uh, to talk to our MPH students and to ask them some questions, including what was, uh, in their opinion, what was um, the most important part of their experience um, at MPH. And it was almost as though their responses were scripted. We, we're not suspicious people by nature, but the consistency of the response was uncanny. And almost to a person, to a, a student, and, and these were lower school students, middle school students, and upper school students, they talked about the special relationships they have with their teachers. And um, you'll likely pick up, if you don't know already, that MPH is, um, I would say it's a smaller school our enrollment's right around 330 students. And that gives us an opportunity and our, my colleagues an opportunity to get to know our students really, really well beyond just what they're teaching them in a particular class. So those relationships are, um, are really essential to um, the, the success of, um, of our students and, and the uh, positive experience that they have. Um, I'm gonna transition now because I have a tendency to go on too long. But the one thing I would share with you is that um, this is a community that is very much dedicated and focused on living out our mission and really carrying out um, our work every day uh, with a set of core values in mind. And uh, a lot of work has happened, as you might imagine, uh, since about a year ago when we, you know, when we all experienced the sort of uh, the full, full blown effects of living during a pandemic. And um, I could uh, talk to you for days and days on end about the kind of um, preparation this school did and the really dedicated people who prepared um, during the course of the spring and all of the summer in a way that has allowed us to be essentially in session, in class, on campus uh, every day. And um, we've, we've prepared in a way that allows us to pivot when we decide that we're going to do, uh, we're going to go to distance learning. And so a big investment in uh, equipment and training for our teachers so that um, we want to carry this education out in a way where there's minimal disruption uh, to teaching and learning here. And um, I'm going to turn it back to Nicole. And as I do, what I, what I also want to share with this group is um, it would be hard to describe the disruption that took place specifically in the admissions area last March, April, May, a lot of question marks over the summer. And um, what matters most to me and to us is that we treat every family with the utmost respect uh, and know that we're here to support you as you go through your experience. And I can tell you this, that our admissions team will do that with every single family. Every interaction is important. The, um, the idea of respecting every family's journey in this process is really important to us. So as I turn it back, I just want to say you're in really good hands with this team and good luck as you, uh, as you go through this, this process. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Uh, I'm so glad that you all got to um, meet Dave personally and directly and kind of get a sense of the, the type of leadership we have here at the school. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. And um, I'm going to give you an overview of our program and community. So two kind of disclaimers that I am, I'm going to share up front. One is that I have been doing my job for nearly a decade and it's still a challenge to find the perfect set of bullet points that defines you know, what is MPH. <laughs> it's, 
incredibly difficult because we're so much. We're a pre-K through 12 community. There's several different grade levels. Um, but I think we've, we've done a nice job of giving you that introduction. The second one is that I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, so my admissions team here has um, offered to be my trustee, um, you know, kind of checks and balances if I don't do this correctly. So uh, bear with me just a second. And uh, we're going to bring up a screen share right now so that I can show you. Can everybody see that? I'm looking to Rachel Smorrell, nod your head if we're good. Okay, terrific. Um, so we're not going to, I assure you, there's not a lot of slides here. It's just a few. Um, and the goal of this presentation, we're actually going to start off with the broadest of strokes. So we're going to give you that kind of view from 10,000 feet. And as we pass through this info session, we're going to get more and more specific. Um, so you're going to get a nice overview of who we are, kind of a, from a philosophical level, what type of a school we are, right down to, um, we're going to show you some cool photographs and give you a virtual tour so you can actually see what's happening right now this year, um, this very atypical school year on campus. So you're going to get a lot of great information, but we're going to start really broad. Um, and the, the best way to do that is to share with you our school's mission and core values. Um, so the mission here is at the bottom of the page. Um, it is few words, uh, but it says a lot. It's a very powerful mission. It's supplemented by our core values. I promise I will not read these word for word. I hate when somebody gives me a PowerPoint and then they read. So you, you are welcome to read through these. These are slightly condensed um, just to fit on the page here and be able to show you. Um, but these are right on our website. You go to mphschool.org, click on about, and you're gonna be able to read our mission and core values. And I really recommend that you do that. Um, reason being is that these are really a foundation and a framework. Um, that guides us. And so when we're doing our work, we are always aiming to bring everything down back to those mission and core values. Um, and I think if you will read them, you'll gain a really good sense of the type of school we are, um, the type of people we are, but most importantly, the type of environment that we are cultivating. And these words, again, not many, many words here, but they give you a true picture um, of our identity. And I think that's a nice place to start when you're looking at a, um, a school for your child. Um, so I do encourage you to go to the website and just read through the mission and core values. It will take just a minute, but they are, um, they're a very kind of beautiful snapshot of who we are. Usually the next question we get in the admissions office, however, is, yeah, but, but what is MPH? I don't understand. How is it different than other schools in the area? It's the number one question we get in the admissions office, and we love answering it. There is an answer to it. Um, before I give it to you, I just want to point out that um, all the photographs you're seeing in this presentation are our students, our teachers. You're actually going to get some shots of our campus, so you'll actually, you're seeing actual um, the inside of MPH. That is Sandra Jones. And she is one of our lead pre-kindergarten teachers. She's just lovely. And I love this photograph with her holding up that seed so that the child can look at it through the magnifying glass. They're doing science in pre-K. It's just a great photo. Um, so to start off uh, explaining who we are, um, it's helpful to understand the type of school that we are. So in central New York, um, there are a variety of educational options for your child. So um, there are plenty of public schools. There are some very strong public schools in our area. And then there's a number of private schools. We actually fall into the latter category, but we're a very specific type of private school. There's a lot of variance in that private category. So the specific type of school we are is an independent school. So we are a member of the National Association of Independent Schools. There are approximately 5,000 nationwide. And we are also a member and accredited by the New York State Association of Independent Schools. That's actually this little logo here you see in the corner. We do go through a regular accreditation process. Um, and that's important to know that we have some overhead and accountability there. Um, within New York State, there's many independent schools. A lot of them tend to, to be more downstate. Um, and as you get upstate, they're, they're kind of not as populated. So there is um, one in Albany, there's two in Rochester, um, there's one out in Buffalo. But between Albany and Rochester, Manlius Pebble Hill is the only independent school, which is why our 330 students, give or take, that number fluctuates every year, 
come from 30 plus school districts in the area. So for parents who are seeking an independent education, they're drawn to MPH. So our students are coming to us from Baldwinsville and um, Utica, and they come from Skinny Atlas, um, and some right from FM in the Syracuse City School District. But each year when we look at our student body, uh, we usually have around 30 to 35 school districts represented in that, which is I think is a, a very cool fact. Um, we are a pre-K through 12 community, as you probably already know. This is one of the th things I think that uh, makes it so happy to work here. Um, that opportunity to cultivate um, relationships between that level of age groups um, is real powerful stuff. And um, to have students have opportunities for leadership and mentorship, they can be a mentor and a mentee all throughout their time here is so important. So even within the lower school, you know, the lower school fourth and fifth graders get to be leaders of the lower school, you know, even though there's, you know, passing by them in the hallway, a junior or a senior. So this really opens up the possibility to cultivate and create real meaningful relationships. And because we're small, you know, everyone, it, we kind of say know and be known. Um, we're a personalized community. And that's really the last bullet here is it's, it's really hard to distill this down into a bullet, but as Dave mentioned, we're a learning community, but we're a community. Being a, a member of this of MPH is something special. Um, and that's because we're small. So we really get to know our students. We get to know our families. We want you to know us. Um, and that is just, it's so important, um, we, it just can't be stressed enough. So usually when you talk to people about MPH, particularly our students, and you say, hey, I work in the admissions office, and what do you think we should be saying to other kids that are looking at the school and other families? And they always say, community, that's, that's what is so powerful about coming here. Now we know there's um, a wonderful academic program and all sorts of other opportunities, but that community connection is a really strong point. So I want to show you something here. This view book um, down in the corner, um, you may have already looked at that. And uh, let's just do a little, oh geez, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> Zoom fail, hold on. That was what I wanted to click. Um, so hopefully you are looking at this view book online. Um, thank you, Rachel, for not, <laughs> Rachel's my checks and balances. She's saying, yes, you did it right. Wonderful. Um, I can't encourage you enough to look at the admissions view book. I promise you it's not a sales brochure. We put so much time and energy into this um, and you can find it really easily. Go to mphschool.org and click on admissions. You'll see my photograph and then this book. Um, and it is a really terrific way to get way more in depth than we could ever do in a, a one hour info session. Um, you'll see some great photographs. That's our, our school library, which you will see in the virtual tour. We've actually repurposed this year to create more learning space, but you'll actually get this nice kind of sense of who we are. This includes testimonials from alumni, from current students and parents, from faculty, um, but I'm clicking through because I want to show you this part here where you'll see, we called it a hundred and more facts, um, but you'll get some nice little bullet points that explain in greater depth each division, um, the lower school, middle school, and uh, arts, athletics. So just tons of great information in here. Um, so again, you just, there's me, um, you just go up to mphschool.org admissions and there you are. We did send out a hyperlink to that um, and we'll send out another hyperlink in the, um, in the follow-up email that we send you all. But we're happy to mail you a copy too. If you would like a hard copy, you can reach out to admissions at mphschool.org and, and we can send you one. If you end up visiting campus in person, we'll, we'll give you a hard copy as well. But just a nice resource that I wanna call your attention to. And this is the last slide before we take a nice little break here. Um, there are certain kind of qualifiers as a, um, oh, hang on one moment here, I'm just letting some people in. We've got some uh, people who want to join us. I want to make sure we're getting them in. Okay. Um, there are certain kind of uh, characteristics of an, an independent school that certainly we have here at MPH, and I just want to highlight a few of them. Independent schools, MPH, are, are usually known for their small class sizes. So we have an eight to one um, student to teacher ratio. Um, the average class size can be approximately 15 students, although that's not a hard number. That's kind of our guiding light. But the idea is, regardless of what the exact number is, it's about our ability to personalize, 
um, and to get to know our students, to get to work deeply with our students, um, to understand their aptitude and give them work that is appropriate for their aptitude. Um, so we do that by making sure that we are keeping our class sizes small. And, um, and that's a really important commitment that we maintain. Hey, oh, hold on. There we go. Um, we have an equal focus on academics and health and well-being. And this is so important because just read the news. Um, more and more young people are feeling things that young people should never feel. Stress, anxiety. I mean, look at the year we just went through, right? Like the collective stress and, uh, and anxiety that kind of came out of 2020 um, is a lot. Um, and it can be a lot on young people. And we want to make sure when um, children are kind of under our tutelage that we are being really um, cognizant and intentional about fostering an environment where we're also looking out for their health and well-being. Um, a student who feels happy and is healthy um, learns best. So it's important to us, it's, it's our responsibility to make sure we're, we're fostering that environment, but that's a real um, intentional act on our part. Um, the, probably the biggest thing is, uh, the biggest thing that helps define us is independent schools have flexibility and autonomy. So we are not bound by the Common Core um, or state-mandated testing. Um, this is sometimes a little bit of a hurdle for parents who are looking at the school because they'll say, okay, if you don't do those, what do you do? Um, and our academic program is built on research. Um, so we are always looking at research about how children learn best, about development, child and adolescent uh, development. Um, you know, different research that comes out on um, how children best learn literacy and math skills. And we're able to, when there is compelling research, do professional development with our faculty where we have ongoing professional development, but we're able to make those kind of pivots um, very quickly because we're, we're very nimble because we, we don't have to be um, kind of adherent to New York State or federal regulations there on, on curriculum. Um, our, I put our expertise there uh, because as, as Dave mentioned in his introduction, we have um, a collective here, a faculty collective that is just dynamite. So many people at MPH are veteran faculty members, though there are always new people we welcome into our community that have great talent and, and contributions to our community. But our school is um, goes back about 150 years. We just celebrated our 150th two years ago. So we like to think we know a thing or two about education and we look internally to our own expertise and aspirations. Where do we want to go? What, what do we think the, the world is going to need out of, um, out of kids you know, in the future? And we're able to build our curriculum on all of those things. Uh, when you look at state mandated testing, uh, like the regents, those are usually used as measures of assessment for how students are performing. So again, some parents are saying, okay, so how do you know that if you're not using those, uh, those measures of assessment? Um, and those can be helpful in really large environments, but we find here that when you know a student really deeply and you're working with them closely, you're able to, to understand their aptitude, know if they're meeting benchmarks, know where they may need support, and know where they're excelling and, and, um, and really strong. Um, if you want to talk about that, what I always say is it's, uh, you know, we as the admissions team are really happy to have those conversations. If that's something that feels kind of confusing, please reach out to us. It's a conversation we have all the time. To also put you in touch with our division heads and faculty who can, who can talk more about how they work with students and measure assessment. Best part about being an independent school is that we keep everything you're seeing here in our program. So these are not considered extras. Um, all of this, everything you see is built into the curriculum with the exception of Model UN, which is an upper school class and club. Um, these are all built into our curriculum right through the middle school. So we really feel it's important for first, school should be fun. Um, we had a great billboard once that said school should be awesome. Um, and if you're doing all of these things alongside your literacy and your math and your science, and then, oh, I'm going to chorus or I'm going to orchestra and I'm doing a great technology elective. Um, we have a dance studio on campus. So our head of middle school, who um, you very well may meet down the road, once called MPH the academic playground. And I thought that was just such a beautiful statement. Um, so our job is to give students exposure to all of these wonderful things so that they can determine where their interests are, where their passions are, 
where their talents are. And ideally we have a, you know, a young person in our upper school who has a level of self-awareness that they can really start to build and customize their upper school academic program based on all these experiences they've had. Um, so it's a, um, a, just an asset that we're able to do that. And then of course, a lot of people know MPH is a college prep school. We do have 100% college placement. Our students perform very well on the, the standardized tests that everyone kind of thinks about, ACTs and SATs. We have incredibly strong track record uh, there. But for us, that's not the goal. Of course, we want our students to get into um, a college that they feel is the best fit for them, that has the best program for what they want to do. But we think about what are the skills and the tools that uh, our students are going to need to be successful in that college environment and beyond. So we like to think of ourselves as, as life prep. What we're instilling in our students hopefully will carry them forth far beyond the college admissions process. Though I will give a little plug for our, um, our um, director of college counseling who is a full-time staff member, faculty member at, at MPH. And that's a nice reassurance for parents of older children who are, are gonna be going through that college admissions process to know that there's a dedicated person at MPH that will shepherd you through the search and application process is a really nice asset. And so that is part of our program as well. So with that, I'm gonna put those away and open back my Zoom window and hope I can do it. Sorry, bear with me. This, is, this was the most stressful part of this, by the way. Okay, and I can't figure it out. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna play the video. <laughs> so I will figure this out. Um, so you've heard from me and you've heard from the admissions team and from Dave, but what we wanted to give you the opportunity to do is actually see some of our students and our teachers um, and our parents. So this video here that we're gonna play is all, um, MPH community members, and none of this is scripted. And I have one thing that uh, I just want to do. Okay, should be good. So enjoy, it's about three minutes long. For me, MPH is about adventures in education. I love challenges, and I love when things are harder for me. The academics are great. It's really well balanced. They're not beholden to state testing. I feel like our teachers have a lot more freedoms to teach us what they feel like we need to know. It's the size and the personal connections. Even if you're in a lower grade, they really make an effort to like have you meet older students. It's a diverse population. You have great teachers who care about the students. You have a school with a tremendous tradition. Everyone is so motivated and invested in their education. I feel like at MPH, the students really push one another to be better. One of the things I really enjoy about teaching here is the ability to take freshmen and to get them to write a college level paper by the end of the year. I feel like I'm being well prepared for my future. Everything that we learn in science is amazing. I really love it. Well, right now my favorite class is World History Intensive. Nihao, what's your punk Christian? So that means, hi, my name is Katie. <laughs> they see themselves and we see ourselves as a community. I think that's really positive. <laughs> the most important thing at MPH is the relationships that you form with your classmates, with your teachers. I use my Manly's Bevel Hill network more than I use even my college network or my law school network. And as colleagues, we push each other, we, we inspire each other, we, we collaborate with each other, and the kids see that. It's just, everything here is more fun. Like in science, we do science experiments every single day. To have a child so happy to go to school, to see his friends, to go to his classes. I laugh a lot during the day. If you want a dynamic educational experience, which is second to none, Please bring your children here to MPH. You will not be sorry. Okay. So 
hopefully you enjoyed that. The best part about that, like I said, is that it was not scripted. So we really appreciate that that was truly authentic and just the quotes that kind of came out of everybody when we were speaking. Um, so we've given you kind of the, um, the kind of big, beautiful picture of who the school is, but we wanted to give you some more candid insights into um, what this year is like. This is a popular question that prospective parents want to know is how are you adapting to this very unique school year? So for that, I am um, excited to have um, our admissions counselor, who's wonderful at this, Amy Mann, is going to lead you through kind of a, a day in the life of MPH right now. So you will get to see our campus through some additional photographs. They may look a little different. Um, you'll see a kind of a lot of things that look um, you know, like masks and hand sanitizer and things that might look a little um, out of place in a typical school year. So I will turn the floor over to Amy with just one quick comment is I'm still getting, um, I'm gonna be the guide here in doing the 360 photographs. And I think I've gotten pretty good at this, but um, my joke was if you have drama me, now might be the time to take it because the, we're spinning around in the 360 photographs. But uh, so with no further ado, let's have Amy take the reins and I will be your uh, Vanna White here. All right, well, if Nicole's gonna be our Vanna. I guess that makes me Julie McCoy. <laughs> was the part in the presentation where if we were together at a traditional open house like we generally do we would all get up and stretch our legs and take a tour of campus and I sure wish that we could do that but since we can't yet we will get our steps today virtually. We've put together what we hope is a pretty good substitute for the time being. Uh, this is a series of 360 degree photos taken by one of our tech teachers. There is no art direction and no photoshopping. I'm just going to put that caveat out there. It's meant to be very candid, very authentic peek inside our doors during the school year. Uh, and while this might differ from the rest of our more polished admissions materials, I think the MPH personality and warmth is still gonna show through and give you a bit of a feel for our environment. So this, our first photo, this is uh, arrival time. There our day begins uh, at our main entrance into the Phoenix Student Center. Students arrive in a combination of buses, MPH vans and personal vehicles. This particular pic shows the inner drop-off lane. Students are being greeted at the front door by our staff. I think that's Adam Sayer right there. And traffic is being safely controlled. You can see somebody standing in the crosswalk there in a vest. Sometimes it's Mr. McCusker himself. I do not think <laughs> one is. Um, we have a single point of entry. That door that's propped open right there after everybody's in. Uh, locks and then you find yourself in a vestibule with a door on the other side and we have a receptionist that buzzes people in. We have a camera system there and if Nicole you want to just gently spin this around you can see that we have if you have not yet visited our campus uh, this all sits behind our trademark building out there is that red barn that's one of our oldest buildings on campus and then inside here is our hidden little gem of a campus. You can see our little quad and Two students there talking to start the day and snow. So I'm sorry we didn't get more of these. We tried to get them in the fall. It was such a spectacularly beautiful fall. Uh, but this is what it looks like right now. So this is very accurate. So now we're gonna go into the Phoenix and we're gonna start our day. These pictures mostly run with younger kids progressing to older kids. Uh, these first three photos that we're gonna go through are all lower school classrooms. And in them, this is like a little catalog of some of our safety and health protocols that have kept us open all school year. You can see that the desks are spaced out. We had an architect actually come in and do the math in each classroom measure and see exactly how many kids we could fit in each classroom, which as Nicole said, is one of the ways we uh, figure out how many kids we can take each year. Uh, you can see masks obviously on the kids. Um, sometimes you can see hand sanitizer in these. Nicole, if you wanna to move to the next lower school picture, we can peek at that one. And you can see everybody working safely together. This is a Singapore math exercise. I think that they're working on right there. Let me just take a look around and kind of spy. This one, this one this is a nice one. You can look outside to our steam park, which I'm gonna show you in another picture. Uh, this young lady is following one of our uh, protocol. She has her very own water bottle, which we encourage keep everybody hydrated and drinking out of their own water bottle all day. So there's a little peek at what's happening in lower school on our on our fake tour this morning. <laughs> now we've moved into this is called the bridge. 
And the bridge is a combination of fourth and fifth grade. This represents the uh, progression from the lower school into the middle school. The middle school starts in sixth. So this is a, uh, and the bridge this year is enjoying one of our most beautiful learning spaces. As Nicole alluded to earlier, this is actually in a normal year, uh, part of our beautiful learning commons slash library. We have a spectacular librarian named Liza Morrison and she really took one for the team this year and uh, allowed her space to be subdivided temporarily, she's been assured, so that we can get the kids far apart and have more learning spaces. You can see this is very bright and happy. Those windows are overlooking our athletic fields. And again, lots of water bottles and masks and good work happening. So that's the bridge. Now we're getting a little older. This is a sixth grade Spanish class. This one you can see was taken uh, a little earlier in the school year because there's some open windows over there on the left there, very good. And we obviously wouldn't be doing that now because we don't want our heating bill to be through the roof, but we still are trying to incorporate as much fresh air into our days as we can uh, in the form of walks. The kids are getting outside with teachers and each other and getting a little mask break, bundling up, a little fresh air, a little energy throughout the day. Uh, and once again, the same, the masks and the distance desks and the hand sanitizer by the door. Now we have moved, this is an eighth grade technology class. And I think we have a special guest in here. If this were an actual campus tour and we stuck our head in here and uh, had the good fortune to find a teacher, usually the teachers will always stop and uh, meet who's on the tour, which is uh, a wonderful thing that they do for us. This is Mr. Ryan Zlomek. He is the tech teacher that actually helped take these photos for us. You can see over next to him, that's a simulcast camera, that black, tower looking thing right there and the big screen. Uh, students had the option to learn from home if they had a reason to this year. So sometimes you, you will see a kid at home zooming into the class uh, on the Google Classroom. So this is the Phoenix Student Center. This, uh, if you came straight in through that arrival photo I showed you at the beginning, this is where you find yourself. And this space was renovated in 2014. It's the hub of campus. It doesn't look very hubby in this photo. Uh, it's usually bustling with kids. Uh, usually the different age groups have the pleasure of mingling, which is a really cool thing about MPH. This year they travel in cohorts and we keep the different levels separate. Unfortunately, this case is full of memorabilia from our long history. Um, and Nicole is nicely spinning back and forth. So the left there, so there's the piano, which somebody is usually playing. There's a little bit of snack set up there. There's some space where students can come and study. There, of course, is the vestibule I mentioned. That uh, closed area there, unfortunately, we aren't using this year in its normal way, but that's usually our campus shop and that's run by the parent association and you can get snacks and swag and uh, some school supplies and things in there. The kids love that. And if you spin it one more time, Nicole, if everybody's not dizzy yet, <laughs> uh, that door right there is the entrance to our dining hall. If you hang a left there, that takes you into our gym and our art wing and the stairs going up to our administrative offices. And you can see there's some colorful posters. Those remind everybody of our protocols. And I think the only thing I didn't point out, I'm sorry to keep spitting this one. <laughs> is, uh, that's our reception desk right there uh, where the little hand is. And normally if you're visiting our school, that's the first place you come and you talk to our receptionist and you get a little visitor badge. And then that door right there to the left takes you into the Bradley wing, which is math and lower school classrooms. And then if you take a right by the reception, um, that is our outstanding nurse's office back there uh, who's doing a wonderful job taking care of everybody this year. So sorry, we spent a lot of time on that one. Uh, this space is the McNeil lobby. This is our previous main entry point into the school. Uh, standing back there is the one and only Steph McCusker. She is doing <laughs> hall monitor duty. We are all pitching in, in addition to our regular jobs this year. Uh, we all have certain things that we pop out of our offices during the day and just help keep things running smoothly. In this case, a uh, snack is about to happen and Steph is just gonna make sure everybody it keeps right and you can see the food spread out there. I can't exactly see what we have this day, but it usually is like granola bars and fruit and grab and go things. Um, so yes, this space like the Phoenix right now uh, cannot be as populated as it usually is. It's more of a pass through, but uh, uh, oh, and that hall right there leads back to the 
math wing, McNeil. Oh, so sorry, sorry. Bradley is the math, McNeil is science. I'm getting dizzy too now, Nicole. I know, in world and, language. In and world. then to the, to the far left there, uh, I should have pointed out when we swung it around before was the mesolingua, that's where the humanities rooms are. And that's McNeil. Now we're gonna go outside for our day. Again, we're flashing back. Look how nice that is to see leaves on the trees. This is our steam park. Uh, this was also recently renovated and it fully enclosed some existing outdoor space to form this super cool uh, courtyard. And the, you know, I said it wasn't posed, but I, she, she's definitely uh, striking a little pose there for us. Um, this is cool. As I said, we tried to get the kids outside as much as we could in the fall. Uh, there's outdoor kind of mini amphitheater seating out here for having classes. Kids could take their lunch out here. There's a the little amphitheater back there and kids could hang out out here. And this is neat because in the good weather, when they redesigned this, now you can walk from one side of the campus where we used to have to stay inside and walk through these all snaking halls. Now you can cut right across campus and go in the other side of the building, which is pretty cool. It's kind of like a tiny college quad. Now, what I would like to know is, Teresa Henderson, are you still on the call? She? I am. <laughs> well, so Just looking for the unmute. <laughs> so this is a treat, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but the next three slides, and we gave them three slides because art is such a fabulous part of MPH and so many cool things. I was going to narrate them, but if you would like to do it, I would love to have you do it because we can kind of simulate the, oh, I look, I just ran into Teresa Henderson and <laughs> can tell us about art. So would you mind doing that? Of course not. I would, I'd love to tell you guys a little bit about it. Um, so this is our, our beautiful gallery space. And it's always curated with some really interesting art that the kids have done. This particular art has a lot to do with what's going on and social justice. There are essentially, when you think of our art program, there's a couple of key things that we really, really focus on. Um, the first one is the technical skill and figuring out how to make something look and feel uh, visually strong or visually striking. And this often is where most art programs would stop. How do I make it look good, for lack of better words? Um, but the second, it's, it's kind of where we just start. The second thing that we really focus on um, is art as a way to learn metacognitive skills. So that's essentially, for those of you who don't know, it's learning how to learn or thinking about the way in which you think or know something. Um, the third thing that we particularly focus on is art as a form of visual communication. So what is it that you are communicating and are you an articulate visual communicator? And uh, we also have a level of individuality for each project. So if you as a student um, is really interested in one specific thing, then that's what we're gonna do. You're gonna try this thing. If you are more interested in another thing, you might try something else. So for instance, in an upper school class, I had this actually past upper school class. I had students working with uh, VR photography, um, another student working in painting, another student working in installation, and then another student working in drawing. And all of those kids are doing completely different things that match who they are and the way that they learn and their interests. Um, and then one of the things that I love particularly about what happens, by the way, there's not actually a class going on here, but there's always somebody working in the space. And it's so much about community. And you'll see all the time students helping other students or talking about art. And it really helps, it really helps not only to elevate their work and their learning, but it gives a really beautiful support network for all of the kids. Um, yep, this is, this is kind of just not even a class happening, but there's always somebody kind of working and in, in the space. Teresa, thank you so much. Uh, she really wasn't a plant. I want to assure everybody. <laughs> I did not know she was going to be on the call. I knew she was in one of the photos, so I was going to talk about her, but yes. I would much rather have her talk herself. And she very modestly did not uh, mention the fact that her students just brought home a whole slew of scholastic art awards uh, in the most recent batch that was given out. So she really does coax amazing things out of these kids and nurture a climate where everyone can feel comfortable and express themselves freely. So, so that's the pitch on art. So thank you, Teresa, so much. 
Now, of all, of that, uh, all of that has worked up an appetite. So I'm gonna talk about every, everyone's favorite topic, which is lunch. Um, this photo, the only thing in it that looks normal compared to how it usually looks are the flags, which do hang in the MPH dining hall always to represent our diverse culture. Other than that, lunch is a complete redux this year. This room is usually filled with round tables. Uh, our students eat by age group. They sit with their teachers, which I always thought was so cool when I was a parent was when my child would come home and say he sat with Mr. or Mrs. And we had this discussion outside the classroom, which I thought was really neat, but we don't do that this year. So lunch is a production, if you can't tell by this photo, our uh, very, very hardworking and cheerful staff has been preparing daily box lunches uh, in accordance with an online ordering system where faculty, staff, and students all place their weekly orders every Monday for the following week. We do honor uh, all dietary preferences and restrictions Lunch is included in your tuition. It is healthy. It is prepared right here by these fine people. I can't tell what's for lunch this day, but it is delicious, I am sure. You can see at the end of the room, uh, all those tall silver carts. The way this happens this year is that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we all have different roles and we all go in at our designated time if we have lunch duty and these guys stack the lunches by classroom on those carts and we physically deliver them to the students in the classroom so we are not mixing kids at mealtime. Uh, this semester we have doubled down on meal safety. Now when they take their masks off to eat they must uh, fuel and put the masks back on and then they can start talking again. So lunch is something we take very seriously. It is the highlight of the day obviously but uh, this year it's pretty tightly controlled and it's going very smoothly. So that is lunch. Now that we are fed, we can get back to work. These next couple shots are just to show you uh, the Phoenix and the McNeil, as I mentioned earlier, while not home to bustling crowds this year are really nice places for some quiet independent study. I think that this young lady is doing her French homework. I think I see some French on there. Um, Nicole, if you want to flip to McNeil. I'm trying to get to that little arrow, that little arrow there. Little arrow there, I see it. Hang on, that was a, there we go. Okay, there's McNeil. And then here's a couple of ladies here. And in the background, that is our Dean of Students, Monsieur Leclerc, speaking of French, coming through the background there on his way somewhere. His office is right on the corner there where you can see that crest on the window. That crest represents one of our houses. Uh, I think we just started this last year or the year before we divided the whole school, students, faculty, and staff into four houses to encourage school spirit and the houses do activities together or uh, service projects or activities, social activities. So uh, he looks like he belongs to Panther. My eyes are failing, but I think that was the Panther crest. Mm -hmm. Now we are, uh, now we're in the upper school and this is an AP physics lab. This is Dr. Utuji. And I wanted to show these with you because science labs are always a highlight of any in-person tour. So Nicole can slowly spin us around and I'm not exactly sure what they're studying. Physics was not my forte, but they're, exactly. they're on it. looks like circuits maybe. And then in the second one in the series, this one we shared, again, you can see the simulcast tower camera there. And these are some kids coming in from home. So you can see that they're able to work together in real time simultaneously, uh, both in class or from home. So there's some science. And now we've done our studying. We're gonna blow off a little bit of steam. This is our beautiful gym. This was a brand new gym built in 2017. This is a middle school gym class, I believe, hamming it up for us. And uh, gym is built into the curriculum through seventh grade. In eighth grade, it's every other day. And then in the upper school, if you happen to choose a couple of our team sports to play, uh, that fulfills your PE requirement. We do offer PE classes at that level, but if you do two sports at any level, at any level of participation, you don't have to schedule in your day, which is kind of cool if you're trying to take advantage of some other things you would like to do during the day. Activities this year are a little bit different. We have to minimize the respiration and sweating and all that stuff. So they are still focused on, you know, shaking it out a little bit during the day and moving and keeping your energy up and having a little bit of fun, but they are not maybe the usual activities that we would do. A quick note on athletics before we leave this slide is that MPH does have a variety of team sports ranging from the modified up through the varsity level. 
and uh, they are all no cut, very inclusive. If you've never played tennis, why not give it a try? You can walk onto the team and likely play at MPH. And we did have a successful abbreviated interscholastic season in the fall, winter is TBD, uh, but that's the gym. And now uh, this is a neat little facility that we have. This is also pretty new. This is our Dreyfus Family Fitness Center. And uh, this is a wonderful new resource for both our teams and our community. You'll often see staff people down here bring their books at lunchtime and, and walk for an hour or whatever they can spare. There's some nice fitness equipment and a little bit of weights. But the best part of this picture is that it's the only picture we have today that shows those are our athletic fields down there. And they really are beautiful. And you don't instantly see them when you enter campus. So it's nice we can at least see them. I see a little soccer goal down there. So those are our fields. So now we've, we've kind of come to the end of our virtual day and we've eaten and we've studied and we've moved our bodies, maybe done some sports. Now we're going to leave campus, which everybody does this year at 3.30 in the afternoon, just to de-densify. You can see the taillights, everybody's leaving to go home and relax and take their masks off and rest up for the next day. And as one little PS, Nicole, if you go to V, uh, I did just want to point out that some people do stay on campus uh, beyond 3.30, and those would be some of our smaller people with working parents that can't be there to pick them up by 3.30. We do offer an extended day program. So there's some little people chilling out, waiting for mom and dad. And with that, uh, I'm sorry that I'm not with you in person because I would have taken questions the whole way through and you would have seen a whole lot more, but I really do hope even though that these are a little unpolished and a uh, little candid that you, you do kind of see the, the team effort comes through and the sense of community. And the reason we have been so, so successful staying open and in person is because everybody from students and their parents to the faculty and the staff really dug in and bonded together and, uh, and made this work this fall. So that concludes the tour for today. Thank you, Amy. That is a Herculean effort to um, give a virtual tour and try to be mindful of all of the health and safety protocols, but you did a beautiful job. So thank you. I hope that um, the families that are joining us feel like that was a nice little kind of helpful insight into, um, you know, what's, what's really happening this year. Um, and now we, we have just a few minutes left. We're actually um, pretty close on time here and, and we're perfectly timed. We just want to give you a couple of bits of information um, about the admissions process itself, um, our accessible tuition program, and, um, and we'll close up with um, a couple of recommendations for next steps. So for the admissions process, we're gonna turn it over to Rachel Smorrell, Assistant Director of Admissions. You will hear from her often, but she's gonna walk you through this particular slide. I'm gonna move this over so you can see. And Rachel can take the floor. All right. Hi again, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit quickly here, so please excuse me, um, I, being mindful of time. So this is the part where you will hear from me. If we haven't already connected, I will get to know you at this point in the process. Um, the goal of our admissions application and supplemental items is for us to learn about your child. And um, we read everything that comes through the parent statement is so helpful to us. The supplemental items vary depending upon division, but they're all thoroughly reviewed as part of our process as a way for us to get to know um, your child looking at our school. Submitting an application does not in any way commit you uh, to anything. It's kind of like what I just went through with my daughter with colleges, um, doing all these applications this January. So it just puts you in our queue and lets you know, lets us know that you're interested uh, in our school. So, and I saw that we have a question in the chat uh, about this. We aren't looking to just fill seats. We make our decisions based upon Space, of the, uh, space availability um, and class composition. And um, we routinely have some really wonderful students that we aren't able to fit in in a certain year and we will waitlist them for the following year. So we're very cognizant 
of what we can do space-wise. And the question was about class sizes for this school year with what we're going through this year. And Amy mentioned that we had an architect come through and measure all of our classes. And that gave us a number of students that we could bring into each class. And this is also why our fourth and fifth grade classrooms are currently in the library so that we could bring in um, just a couple more students in there. So we didn't increase our class size. In some cases we had to cap our class size um, because health and safety this year has really been um, a huge part of everything that we've done. And I think we've done a pretty good job since we've been able to stay open um, for the whole school year, pre-K through 12. So that's pretty cool. So in years past, we would always have children come to campus and spend a day on our campus. And it was a really great way for children to meet current students and they spend the whole day, they go to all the different classes. That's obviously not something that we can do anymore. But once a student is accepted, we will arrange for them to be able to zoom into classes to see what our classes are like, to see if you think it's a good fit. Um, if you have any particular classes that you're really passionate about, um, we will do our best to allow you to zoom into those classes as well. We also wanna provide lots of opportunities to connect with our community. We have a parent ambassador program that will welcome you and your family. We have um, a place on our website called Connect With Our Community for parents to reach out to current parents and ask them questions about our school as once again, you are going through trying to make those decisions about what is best for your family. And finally, campus tours also used to be a part of our process a little bit earlier because we can't allow a lot of people on campus. We've had to scale those back. And if a student is accepted, we will make sure that you get to visit our campus. It will most likely be on a weekend. Um, because we have to keep in mind health and safety protocols, but we truly want everyone to get an opportunity to see what our campus is all about. It's a lot more fun when the kids are there, but um, it's an important part of the process as well for you to be able to make an informed decision. Thank you, Rachel. So, um, and I like that you okay. you did, um, you did, you did them very quickly, which was lovely. Um, and what I like too is that you did, you, um, it's worth re-mentioning that submitting an application doesn't commit you to anything. It just allows us to know that you're interested. So you're in our admissions queue. We can offer you resources and opportunities to learn more about us through a variety of channels. And if you are offered admission to the school, um, we will always give you time to make that decision and use that time to, again, help you make connections or gain information as you're making your decisions to whether or not to accept our invitation to join our community. So it's a very, um, you know, we are, we are not here to um, apply any sort of pressure. It's really about getting to know one another. We're about to enter into a, um, hopefully, a very long partnership with your child's best interest in, at heart and at mind. So it's really just about that ability to get to know one another. So everybody, when they come in in the fall, just feels really excited. I, I think we do a good job um, with this. Our retention rates are very strong at the school. We have um, every year well above 90% retention. Um, and that's a good, uh, I think a good thing for prospective families to know that the, the families that have come before you and made this decision are happy with their experience and, and, uh, and certainly you know, we're able to make a confident informed decision. Um, this is Mr. Varel. He's one of our awesome science teachers. He has been here probably, he, we're getting close to like more years than I've been alive. Some of our faculty have been teaching at MBH. Um, and, uh, and he also works in our summer program. So he's very popular with the kids. Um, they just kind of love him. Um, but what I want to talk about on this slide, and again, I'll move relatively quickly. Um, and, and forgive me, I just I want to put it right out there because you all for attending this session um, have done exactly what we hoped you would do, which is come and learn more about us. There are many times where people sometimes review us on the website or get a little information and they say, oh gosh, I could not afford an MPH education. It sounds great, but tuition's not in my reach. And they stop there. And so you've taken that first step toward us, which is wonderful. 
Um, I just want to explain one thing about our tuition rates. So we provided a lot of great information about what it means to be an independent school. Um, what it also means is that um, we do not receive the federal and state funding that most schools do, which is why our tuition rates are very different than some other schools in the area. Um, and uh, one very helpful thing that prospective families have always appreciated knowing is if you were to look at pretty much any public school in the area, um, they will always provide a number of what they spend on each of their students called spending per student. And if you were to look at that number and then compare it with MPH tuition rates, you're gonna find that they're incredibly similar. Um, so the tuition is not because we think we are elite um, or because we think we are offering something that we can just charge a lot of money for. This is the money that we, uh, we're a nonprofit organization. All of our money goes back into our program and our community to provide this educational experience. But we annually award over $1 million in tuition grants and scholarships because nobody, uh, no educator, or nobody who works in schools would say that the best learning community is comprised of children whose families can pay full tuition. So there are families who are able to make that tuition commitment. Um, but to give you a helpful statistic, this year, um, amongst our 330 students, about 45% of those are receiving financial support at varying levels through our accessible tuition program. So some students um, are here on a full scholarship. Um, other families are saying, gosh, I, I could do 60 or 70% of tuition um, and they need just a little bit of help. So there's a wide variance in the amount of support we can provide. Um, some of our scholarships are, are larger, as I mentioned, those endowed scholarships. We've got wonderful opportunities through a Malone uh, scholarship, a Lenore scholarship that can provide a lot of access to great kids. But again, just like our admissions decisions, when we are looking at um, allocation of financial aid, we follow our goals for our class size and composition. So we may have a class that says, gosh, this, this class is great, but it really needs another you know, 10 students in it. Um, so we're gonna allocate more financial aid to that grade so we can meet our goals for class composition. Um, but the eligibility for um, financial support is always part of our admissions process. We welcome any and all interested family families to come and have that discussion with us. We have made it as simple as possible um, to do some early uh, kind of pre-qualification analysis so you would be able to know kind of early on if you would be eligible for financial support. Um, so our goal is to help you get this information. So we encourage you to go ahead and take these next steps, which is the last slide, um, and then we are, we're going to let you go, I promise. Um, if you have not already done so, we really encourage you to submit the admissions application. That's gonna allow us to start working with you and providing more information and resources. Um, explore our website. Uh, we, we mentioned on a couple of things that are, are um, oops, we had somebody drop out. Okay. Um, a lot of great resources and a, kind of a treasure trove of information on the website. Um, keep reading our admissions e newsletter. We'll keep sending that to you. Um, we will let you know of upcoming events, just like this one. We'll have some different style events coming up throughout the spring. Um, and in the admissions e-newsletter, what we want to do is share stories with you. So it's a great way to get some anecdotal stories about, okay, but what are they doing over there? Um, so we'll kind of pick and choose some great stories to share with you through that. Um, reach out to us with questions, certainly. We, that's what we're here for. As you could tell, we love to talk. We love to answer your questions. We're friendly people. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, sometimes it, it might take us a day or two to get back to you, but we're pretty responsive, um, so we will be in touch with you. And even better than getting in touch with us sometimes is doing exactly what Amy and Rachel both mentioned, is to talk to our parents because they have gone through this process already. They are here. They're experiencing the program and community. They're a wonderful resource. We've made it really easy for you to do that. If you go to our website, we will link you to this. There's a page called chat, uh, connect with MPH parents. I thought it was called chat with our community, but I think we switched that. This is actually just a portion of the page. I think there's eight or 12 parents on this page. So the cool thing is you can kind of go shopping and you can look around and say, oh, that parent is from my school district or this parent has children the same age as me. You could reach out to two or three, but you can kind of pick and choose who you think might be able to give you the most helpful information. Um, and these are great, these are our parent ambassadors. So again, just a little sampling of them on the page there, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. 
and welcome you all. So now I see all your, your faces again. Um, so nice to see you all again. <laughs> Um, and I hope that this was really helpful and that it gave you uh, lots of great information. This was kind of jam packed with a lot of info. Um, so we don't wanna take up any more time than we already have for those who um, are needing to head somewhere or just kind of done with their day and need to take a breath. Um, but um, we are willing to stay online here for another 10 or 15 minutes and do some um, chat questions. So to those who, um, who would like to go, we bid you a happy farewell. We are so grateful you joined us today. So thank you so much for taking that time and, and uh, learning more about us. We hope we get to talk to you again soon. And for those who wanna stay on, uh, we, I'm gonna do my very best now to, to keep my eye on the chat box and see what we've got going on, but we're gonna take some questions. Okay, I think we started with this one, right? Rachel talked about the class size increasing since the pandemic started. That's actually no. Um, how is the science area? It's awesome. Um, we have four very large um, lab classrooms. You saw some of those. One of them, the physics classroom on the virtual tour. Um, more so than the area, the program. The science program here is um, phenomenal. Students are able to do some really compelling, cool, independent research. Um, actually, we start that in the fourth and fifth grade, uh, and we do um, a huge STEM fair every year. Again, that's not an extra, it's something um, our students do through our program. Um, but that concept that science is kind of getting your hands dirty, it's not necessarily um, you're learning from a textbook. Um, so it's a, a great program. One of the photos in the PowerPoint actually was Sue Foster, our science department chair, who has been here 20 plus years um, and just has amazing resources within the community. So for example, Last year, Sue had a student who was really interested in aeronautics and avionics. Um, and we passed the gym one day and she had students with parachutes strapped onto their backs. And they were running and, and somebody was kind of measuring um, the kind of speed at the, that they were running with the parachutes kind of slowing them down. And they were doing all these cool experiments. And then she had um, somebody that she knew that actually works in the field um, of aeronautics and she brought them in to speak to the class. So, what a great example of, you know, there was kind of an organic interest in something and she was able to just kind of tap into that and do some really cool things with it. So science is, science is cool here at MPH. It's a big part of what we, we do. And I will, I will brag just because you asked. Um, we have had a really good track record of MPH students um, competing at local and national and international STEM fairs. So um, I think we're up to five students who were invited to join the Intel International STEM Fair in the last 10 years, which is pretty impressive from a small school like ours. Um, and, and two of them actually took, um, took top honors at the International STEM Fair. I would love to describe to you what their research was, but I truly don't understand it. And I am not a science person, but, um, but just sky's the limit there. Um, do I anticipate having seats? Yes, we do. Um, we are having this conversation um, very regularly and frequently with our division heads. Um, so one thing we're going to actually do here in the next month is a process that we called re-enrollment. Um, we do this annually, but the first thing we do is look within our current community and make sure that we know, um, are you planning to come back next year? Again, like I mentioned, our retention rates are very strong. So more than 90% of our community returns to us each year, but we want to know if there is gonna be a vacancy um, we, so that we can plan ahead and welcome in a new student. But there are also opportunities kind of organically where, you know, our, our lower school starts off kind of small. You know, there may only be 15 students in a particular grade, but by the time that grade gets to the upper school, it might have 45 students in it. So at certain levels, um, there are opportunity to always bring in new students. Usually that's, um, you know, in, in middle school and the start of upper school. Um, so this year, the only thing that we're having to be additionally cognizant of is kind of having to be a little bit of a forecaster and see what the physical distancing requirements are going to look like as we move through these next few months. Vaccines coming online, I think, is a very exciting and hopeful development. Um, it, we're looking to see how that changes the landscape. Um, so um, please don't let that be a deterrent. Um, we, we want to take your applications. We will stay in touch with you. We will let you know where spaces are available. But we always have, a, we have a goal to bring in about 80 new students next year across a variety of grade levels. So there are, are certainly opportunities. 
Uh, does the coming year appear to be closer to our previous normal giving a vaccine? I want to throw this to Mr. McCusker. Mr. McCusker, this seems like a, a you question, but I'm putting you right on the spot. All right, let me get my magic my uh, magic right. eight Do you have ball an eight, out here. Magic eight ball? Um, yeah, honestly, who, who knows? Um, and I would be a fool to try to offer a prediction. What I will share with all of you is uh, another element of the school's commitment to, to health and safety. Uh, we have a pandemic response team. We've got eight people on the team and that team, I'm on it. Uh, that team meets every morning uh, for between 45 minutes and an hour. Uh, we're typically addressing issues related to health and safety uh, during the pandemic. Um, and we've got some very clear uh, guidelines and protocols. Uh, we're, we're making a big commitment to this. So what we've been saying lately is, uh, you know, we're all encouraged that in central New York, the, the positivity rates are actually on, you know, they're going down a bit and that's terrific. But we also know that we can't, uh, we can't uh, slough off our commitment to good health and safety. We're keeping an eye on the, the variant strain that we're learning about. Uh, so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna err on the side of caution. We're very reasonable. We wanna do everything we can, but the first commitment for us is the health and safety of, of the community. So uh, vaccinations are starting to happen. Well over 50% of, our, uh, of our, our colleagues have gotten at least their first shot uh, and scheduled for the second. We're doing testing on a regular basis, even when we don't need to, we're, we're still committed. We, that is uh, part and parcel of uh, our MPH health protocols. And uh, we're all hoping for the best. One of our mantras is under promise and over deliver. So we wanna make sure that we're planning uh, appropriately. And if um, as we go forward, uh, things begin to look better and better, well then that's terrific. But uh, I, would, I would never try to offer a prediction on, on uh, something that's really quite uh, uh, dynamic and it's evolving every day. Well said. Um, so this one here says, is there a swimming team? Um, we, we don't have a swimming team because we actually don't have a pool on campus um, yet, but um, in years past, we have been combined um, with other school districts. At one point we were combined with JD for swimming. So those sorts of things are um, actually fall under the purview of our athletic director. Um, we offer, as, as Amy mentioned during the virtual tour, there's a lot of different opportunities for athletic programs here. Um, for ones that we don't have, we will seek out opportunities as we can to perhaps combine with other school districts. That can get a little complicated um, because it's essentially up to the other district whether or not they have room for our students to participate. So some of those things can go in and out. Um, if I can steer you away from swimming and we can get you skiing, we have um, actually one of the only alpine ski racing teams um, locally. So uh, we have a great team that does skiing and snowboarding. If swimming ever, you know, maybe we, we shift that. Um, this is a great question. So um, Barendra, uh, I hope I said that right. Um, the transition to other schools to MPH from ninth grade. Um, this is such a popular question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, we give a lot of support to new students coming in and we do a lot of diligence in the admissions process to make sure that students who are joining us from other um, programs are prepared to make this shift. You know, it, it has nothing to do with intelligence, um, but what we look at are how, how, where are the students' strengths and weaknesses? Do they need support in one area or the other? Are they going to be able to make this shift? The last thing we want to do is have a student come into our program and then struggle. However, um, you know, our acceptance rates are not designed to be exclusive. So um, we will always see potential in students. Um, we do wanna make sure that we're the right environment for them. But as far as transitional support, um, we offer a lot of that and um, in, it's kind of carried forth throughout the school year. So we would invite you to things like an orientation over the summer. Um, students would get to meet one another. They would get to meet with the head of upper school. But really during the school year, that, that kind of um, notion of support carries forth. So every student here has an advisor in small groups, they will meet in advisory and tutorial. Um, tutorial is actually a, a period of time every day where no academic classes are scheduled in the middle and upper school. And that, um, so kids go to their advisor's classroom and it's that person to kind of check in on them 
um, to be that kind of person that can help them with time management or, or um, anything they may need support on. And they can actually sign out um, of tutorial to go see other teachers. So there's a lot of kind of built-in support that way, but it's really about the relationship between the faculty and the student. There's also teams. So for example, um, grade seven has team seven. That's any faculty member at MPH who teaches a seventh grade course. That team uh, will pretty much meet weekly to, to talk about all the kids in the seventh grade. Um, so the kind of notion of support extends beyond just the new students. You know, we also think about how about our students that are coming out of our own middle school experience or this when does our grade eight prepare students to enter into the upper school. Um, it is very rare, incredibly rare that a student will come to us and then have to return back to their home district. I mean, it, it's, there's probably been a few cases like that, but it's incredibly rare. So I think the admissions process is reassuring in that way. If we offer a spot, we have good faith that we're a really great program and match for your child. And then we're going to offer that support to um, to help if they go through any kind of roller coasters or hurdles that we're there to, to support them through that. Um, and that's just oh how nice. Okay, when will admissions decisions be made if application is complete? It's a rolling basis. Um, so this year, because a lot of our classrooms are at physical capacity. We don't necessarily know what physical capacity is next year. This is why our admissions decisions are a little bit held up um, and we're very closely paying attention to our re-enrollment. Um, but typically we would, in, in a normal year, we'd be communicating on a rolling basis with all of the families in the applicant pool and offering out spaces as we have them. the financial aid process flexible enough for that uncertainty um, it will only be based on my current income. You know what, we meet and discuss this with every family. There is no typical ever. Every family situation is entirely unique. Um, and what a year to have uncertainty. I think so many people are saying my income in 2020 was um, was very different than it normally may be, or I lost my job and I'm, I'm kind of job seeking. Um, we don't want that. If, if this is the time, if this is the right time for your child to join our community, um, that doesn't necessarily have to be a barrier. So there is some flexibility in the financial aid process, though the one thing we're also cognizant of is that when we award financial aid, a grant or a scholarship to a student, we want that family to have assurance that that's going to carry forth with their child. We don't want it to be like every year you have to kind of wonder if you're going to get your financial aid. Um, or if it's going to change dramatically. So consistency there is really important to us. So sometimes if we are not sure that we can be consistent with the award, we may advise waiting because we don't want to, to say, oh gosh, we can do this this year if we're not sure we can carry that forward. So I hope that makes sense and answers that question. Um, what sports do you offer for girl or boy? So I'm actually going to direct you to the website here. Um, if you go to the website and then um, click on, I want to actually say click on academics, we actually put our athletic programs right under that tab. And you'll actually see what we have for fall, winter and spring sports. It's a pretty robust list. Um, so I would direct you there. Right, oh, that was a direct message to me. Sorry, someone's in the waiting room. <laughs> Are there opportunities for... Oh, who asked that? What a great question. There are plenty of opportunities for creative writers. So MPH is a, um, we love writing. We are kind of writing intensive when you compare sometimes to other programs. So we are really building strong communication skills in our students. Um, we value writing. We value students um, and young people who learn how to be self-advocates, how to give presentations, how to speak publicly, and absolutely how to write. So you heard that little clip in the video, um, Mr. Toomey Smith, our history and English uh, faculty member, say, gosh, I love getting my ninth graders to, to write a college level paper. Um, it's not scary. It's done here with loads of support and encouragement and instruction. Um, but our students do leave our program as really strong writers. Creative writing, absolutely. We have um, a creative writing courses. Um, there are clubs. There's a um, I'm just trying to think of the name of it. So Rachel or Amy, if you think of it first, um, the magazine where the students do the, their creative writing. Um, oh. Yes. Pebble? No. Yes. No. So Pebble is the, um, the newspaper or the, the journal. The Rolling Stone. Thank you. The Rolling Stone. Yes. 
No, you can see it. I could see the picture of it in my head and I couldn't think of it. Um, yeah, so that's where our students can write poetry and short stories and that gets kind of published every year. But yeah, um, we love writers. So um, absolutely. I think we've gone through all the chat questions here and we're right at the end of our program. So this was- um, There are well a few done. more. Are there? there? Are Help me out, Ms. McCusker. Okay, um, let's see. How do you make sure you recruit and retain the most talented teachers? I'm, gonna, I'm going to have Mr. McCusker. I'm so glad you're here. That's a great question for our head of school. Well, that, that, that response has many, many components to it, but I'll do the short version of it. Actually, one of the things you might be interested in, um, uh, MPH is right now at the front end of a strategic planning process. And one of our big priority areas is, um, is to support uh, educators uh, to retain, attract, invest in educators uh, who are well suited for this kind of experience. So as you heard, um, a, a typical MPH educator is doing more than just uh, being in a classroom and teaching that particular subject area. There are lots of opportunities to uh, serve as an advisor to students. You might be coaching a sport. You would likely be involved in a club of some kind. And so the first thing we need to do is really be clear about what it entails to be a, an MPH teacher. Um, every year uh, we have our experience and um, we get a sense of how things are going at our school. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes folks decide to leave MPH to pursue a, a degree perhaps, or maybe even another, uh, another professional opportunity. And we're also assessing how, how our folks are doing. So there's an annual kind of assessment process that way. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, uh, we also know that uh, this is a competitive thing for us. So as part of a strategic planning process, we're looking at being highly competitive in terms of compensation. Uh, we're looking at opportunities to um, do more and more in the area of professional development. So that there's an investment there. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then otherwise, uh, very organically on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, again, a tight, small, close-knit uh, community we, we get a pretty good sense of how things are going uh, with our folks. The, uh, you know, any, any human endeavor uh, includes a variable, right? And so uh, not everything works out beautifully across the board, but uh, it is absolutely one of our strengths. We've got a, we've got a, um, a top notch uh, group of educators here, people who are deeply and personally invested in what they do. They believe in, in, um, in the school. So uh, there is a process for us to assess, to, to recruit um, teachers. And uh, yeah, we, we're doing that on an ongoing basis. I work with three division heads. I had a two hour meeting with them. We have a standing meeting every Thursday morning and we're talking about these issues all the time. So it's a, it's a, a, a school commitment for sure. May I jump in here too? Um, I think a, a, a really, telling piece of information is that most of our faculty choose to send their children here to MPH. So they are really invested on a really personal level uh, in what they bring to the classroom. If I could just say, um, as far as retention goes, what you guys might not be able to see from the videos or from the brochures, there is an amazing culture here. Everybody is really, really engaged and wanting to learn. And that includes the teachers too. I can sit down at a lunch table and we can talk about anything from Chaucer to Game of Thrones to what's happening in science. And it is a different level of, of kind of mental engagement. And for a teacher, for someone who genuinely loves to learn, to be around other people who are excited about what they're doing, who are continuing to learn. It is one of the coolest environments you could possibly be in. I came from a school before where I used to dread going into the faculty room because people were so negative or they would, you know, they'd complain so much. When I go into the faculty room, I'm, we're talking ideas, People are like, oh, it'd be so cool if you would collaborate with this, or what are you learning in your classroom, or what are you doing? People are genuinely excited, 
And being around a community like that, that makes it worth it. And that makes it really exciting. That's amazing. I'm so glad that you joined us. <laughs> so nice to have your perspective directly. That's a, that was just so beautifully said. Thank you, Teresa. We have one last question, Nicole. Okay. Um, oh, actually, I see two. I see another one popped in here too. I don't know if you have time for both. Um, this first one is: Do you have merit-based scholarships to offer students? And if yes, how do you make the decision based on academic performance or other considerations? And and then the the last question is from the same person: uh, Do you accept international students? And if yes, what is the minimum age requirement? Great. Okay. So um, the merit-based scholarship. So. In, in many ways, because we have an admissions process, everything we do is has some level of component of merit to it. Um, we will go through the exercise of the pre-qualification worksheet, even when people say, you know what, I, I may not qualify um, for some, some financial support. And a lot of people are, are surprised to say, okay, you know, maybe it's $2,500 um, that makes it possible for your child to be here. So there is often a component of merit um, it's a little too hard to get into the weeds about our scholarships themselves and which ones have need-based components, but a lot of times when we're looking at scholarships, the donor or the foundation that provides that scholarship will actually dictate that that does have to go um, to a student who has financial need or demonstrates financial need. Um, but again, I go back to that statement of there is no such thing as typical. A lot of times parents will come to me and say, um, what's the cutoff? If I make X or above, am I going to get financial aid? And I actually have a spreadsheet that lists this all out. Um, you know, if you make $300,000 but have five children, that looks very different than I make $300,000 but I have two children. Do you have five children and you're sending all of them to a tuition-based school? Um, do you have five children and only one is going to a tuition-based school? So there is such depth to our ability to really get to understand a family situation. And again, we, we want to work with you. Um, you know, it is hard. We, we are unable to give, I think, large scholarships to families that have financial capacity because there are families in our applicant pool with students who are equally deserving who demonstrate financial needs. So we do have best practices that guide us. Um, but again, nothing should stop you from taking that first step and talking to us and at least finding out. Um, and the uh, other question was international students. We do have international students at MPH that changed slightly. Um, COVID kind of really changed the landscape on students' ability to travel. Um, however, we do have uh, international students typically in grades nine and higher. They stay with us for the duration of the academic program and graduate and go on to um, colleges or universities here in the US. Um, occasionally we've had a student in eighth grade join us. Um, so we are accepting applications and we'd welcome that conversation as well, as well for the fall. And I think we've got them, unless something else popped up, Steph, I think we've got all the questions covered. They were great questions. So, um, got just them thank all. You. awesome. Thank you. Thank you for keeping your eye on the chat too. So, um, I appreciate that. So, um, again, thanks so much to you all for spending this afternoon with us. It's been a, a true pleasure. I hope that this was helpful to you. Um, and again, we hope we are talking to you soon. We'll be in touch. We're going to follow up and share out a recording of the session. If you liked it so much and you want to watch it again, um, we will share out a recording and more information with you in the next couple of days. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Thanks, everyone.